Today we are very happy to have uh, Yahui Zhang uh, telling us about a new theory of the super gap methods. Let's welcome Yahui. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming and thanks for inviting me to this interesting seminar. So today I will talk about the, our recent work on super gap methods. Basically, on this recent paper I wrote together with Peter. So now in 1980s, there are two big discoveries on the reflection quantum point and on its coupet. So and, uh, I think these are the most uh, important uh, experimental discoveries in the last several decades. So unfortunately, I was born too late, so I missed both. <laughs> so I think nowadays, if I wanted to make uh, some new theoretical development in reflection quantum point, it's very hard. Uh, the theory is already in a good shape. But uh, fortunately, I can still do something in Kubernetes. Because in Kubernetes, despite uh, a lot of papers for several decades, the problem is still not solved. So we can still do something. And uh, today I will present uh, some of my attempts to understand the pseudo gap method in Kodo. So this is the uh, final slide. So first I will review the phenomenology of Kubernetes in our term. My theory. And in the third part, I will discuss the generalization of this theory. So apply this theory to other systems other than concrete. It turns out it's a kind of general framework. So what is concrete? So the concrete is actually very complicated. If you look at the crystal structure, so there are a lot of different uh, concrete. So these are several different families. Look at the crystal, and it's very, very complicated. Uh, according to you, so the essential physics of Kuklet is we believe it's bounded by just a, a 2D plane. So you just focus on this plane, it's formed by a common atom and the oxygen atom. So this makes our study much simpler. And uh, even better, we can actually wrap it down a simple Hubbard module from Kuklet. So basically, we have to electrons pop on this square matrix. There is a Hunting term T. So this is the Fermi part. And then there is another term. So this term is uh, called the Harvard U. It's an outside uh, impressive interaction. So this model is very simple. I guess this is the simplest model you can write down, which is beyond the Fermi. However, we believe this simple model hosts a very rich physics. So first, and the zero dope, so by zero dope, I mean the number of electrons is one electron per set. So then, you will find that because of this large U, the electron will be frozen. Basically, you have one electron per set. The charge cannot move. Because you move one charge, you will find that there must be a set which has two electrons. But if you have two electrons, there is a large energy cost of the U. So therefore, on the ground state, you have the charge frozen completely. And you still have a spin. But for square lattice, you know the spin will just form in order. Therefore, at the zero doping, you have a more instant with in order. So the amazing thing happens when we dope this more instant. So if you look at this face diagram, so there are two different kinds of doping. You can increase the number of holes or increase the number of electrons. Yeah, so in the right side, that's called the hole doping. So we will focus on this side. So this sign means the number of electrons per set will be changed to one minus p. So p is the doping level. So you can see when you dope it, you actually find a superconductor. And this superconductor actually has a very high Tc. So that's the initial interest. And there are also some other interesting cases. You can increase the temperature above the Tc. So usually you have a superconductor. You increase the temperature, you just get a thermonegative. So this time, it's not. You find the normal state is not a problem. So in the other dose region, when the dose is small, you find a super gap method. So why is super gap not a problem? So what is the exotic about this super gap? So it has several interesting properties. So I will just discuss some of the properties of which I think are essential for super gap. So the first one is this formula. 
So first, you can calculate the balance structure in the just the free Fermi. So you just ignore the direction, calculate the balance structure based on type value. You find that there is a whole Fermi surface, the center behind the pi pi. This is the free Fermi result. Then you can mirror the, the Fermi surface by R pi. So of course, at the high temperature. So in the large doshes, when your doshi area is large, you need to find this kind of larger hole for the surface, which is consistent with the Fermi result. However, something very strange happens at the small doshi. So it seems there is a critical doshi, passing up below this critical doshi. You don't find a closed Fermi surface. Instead, you only find the form Fermi arcs. So by arcs, I mean, so the density defect two moment, so one is common node, the other one is common antinode. So the node is like a parallel to parallel to the density field. So you have four nodes. You also have some antinode. Antinode is here, so that's the k zero. So from this experiment, you will find that the antinode is actually gapped. So if you look at the antinode here, you don't find any spectral waves. So it looks like the, the part of Fermi surface here is just disappears for some mysterious reasons. And you only find a, a segment of the surface, a rather than node. And when you decrease the doping level, you find the length of this framework actually shrinks. So this is very strange. So from theory, we don't know any theory which can give you arcs. In any theory of the electron, you always form some kind of Fermi surface. So this is another experimental discovery. So people try to measure the Hall number. So the, the information is the Hall number is equal to the carry density. So they apply Hall magnetic field, which kills the superconduct. Then they can measure the Hall number. So at the so P is the doping level again. So at the large doping, it looks like the Hall number is just equal to 1 plus P. So 1 plus P is the number of holes. So this is the true Fermi result. But it seems there is a critical doping P star. So when you go below this P star, the whole number just drops rapidly. In the, in the small doping region, the whole number of the carrying density is equal to P instead of 1 plus P. So the number of holes is 1 plus P. But it seems that only the P can move, the P number of electrons can move. The other one, electric precise is still gap or low cluster. We don't contribute to uh, transport measurements. Is below P star slow gap already? Yeah, we believe this is slow gap. Below P star? Yeah. Below P star? Oh, below P star? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's a view. <coughs> so from this, it implies that uh, the slow gap can have some kind of small permissions instead of large permissions. So this is again very strange. Um, you must be familiar with Lagrangian theorem. So Lagrangian theorem will tell you if the number of electrons is one plus p, the Fermi surface area should be one plus p over two. So this two is just the fact that we have two speeds. So this theorem is correct if you have two, if the following two assumptions are preserved. So the first one is we need to have a spin location and just let me the second one is that this uh, state is to be featureless. So we cannot have a fractionalization or the logical dissertation. So now in the experiment, we seen that we found a small Fermi surface. So this ex ex implies that we must violate this two this wall distance. So to explain the so gap, so you need a, so there are two different types of series. They basically choose the one condition to violate. There are two different types of series. So the first one is the same, so we brief the switch. Let's say there are some density wave orders. Then we can get out of the Fermi surface. The other school of theory is that we don't need a simple brief, but we allow some kind of exotic phase, which is has some gauge field of recognition. In this case, we can get a small Fermi surface without any density wave order. So of course, if you wanted to come to this field, and the study through the gap we must choose one. So I will choose the second one. So why? So the first reason is because
because I'm a PhD student of MIT. <laughs> but this is not a scientific reason. <laughs> it has a scientific reason. So, so in the in the hall data you showed there was a CDW region. So this is at the high magnitude. So it turned out that the high magnitude you were developed long rare CDW. But at the zero magnitude there is no long rare CDW. But it seems there is some instability when you apply very strong magnitude. Yeah, so so let me explain why we don't want to Basically, all this. There are two reasons. First, is the experiment. So, if you look at an experiment, inside the sort of gap net, you can find a region which does not have any long range. Basically, all this. This is one case that I found in all the internet. Actually, you can find that there is a summer region. You can find that it has some CDW or child log. However, this is not a true CDW. And there will be the combination length of this CDW is actually short. From the definition of textbook, this is not a long range CDW. And more important, this is you know, this CDW only occupies a small region of the gap. You can find the other regions of the gap which does not have a CDW or any other distant orders, but it still, still has the special exotic property like Fermiak. So this means we cannot use the distant wave order to explain the CDW. Actually, I have a question. That's you say you must choose one or two, but why not choose both? You can also choose both. Yeah, you can. Uh, why? Why not? It could be new order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe I'll comment yeah, on that. Yeah, it is possible, but uh, it's not this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so this is the first thing you know, signal in experiment. We actually don't find it on right? So the signal is from Siri. So we found that this so the gap network is actually close to a multi state. However, if you want to describe a model instead, you cannot use the conventional means this like lambda theory. So in the model instead, it has a special property. I will call it spin chart separation. This is beyond the lambda theory. So to describe a model instead, you must have a new framework. And this subgap method is developed from optional model. So if you don't have the ability to describe a model table with lambda theory, I believe you cannot describe the same gap with the scale. You must have a, a different framework. This is from a theoretical perspective. So of course you will ask, so in Kodrat, this model is actually has a new order. So there is nothing exotic, there is no fractalization. You ask, why don't we just describe this model instead of this model? So there is actually a naive mean phase theory for corporate model state. So because it has a new order, so it has a lambda lambda mean theory. theory. So basically, it does add the new order at the Fermi behavior. From this, you can get uh, an instant. That's called a spin test wave instant. And from this theory, you will have a prediction that the, the insulating gap, the charge gap, is proportional to the all the parameters of the new order. However, this is not consistent with the experiment. So in the experiment, find the charge gap is much, much larger than the new order. Actually, this is very easy to understand. And the new order is from the Facebook top spin coupling. You know, the spin coupling is the inverse Q, but the charge gap is proponent. Now, the spin order magnitude is the inverse of the charge gap. And in this naive mean field theory, you will reach the conclusion that they are proportional. So this basically means the naive mean field theory is wrong for multi state. So the essential feature of multi state is that this charge gap is not uh, induced by spin order. I think the correct picture is the spin order is a, they first get this charge gap at a much larger energy scale, and then develop the spin order. And once you accept the spin charge separation, there is actually a very, very simple picture of a sub gap method. So, this is my theory of sub gap method. So, before I explain it, I can share with some of my personal story. So, I have a friend who is an experimentalist. So sometimes he will ask me what kind of measurements I can do. So, I told him if you find the insulate and the interfere, 
a mod like this way. It just do it. You will find a small group of, you will find the current density is proportional to the Doshi. And he says, yes, but so what? This is so true. You find a mod insulin, you do it, of course you get a small group of this. I think it, what is in his mind is this picture. So you have a mod insulin. And in this most insulin, the charge is gap. You have two beds. Usually it's called a higher hybrid bed. The other one is called a lower hybrid bed. Of course, when we dope it, this charge gap usually will decrease with the dope. But let's assume it does not close immediately. Let's assume that there is a doping region that this charge gap actually remains. Now what you do is you, you just shift the pin protector, so this green really line the pin protection. In the modern state, it's inside the gap. When you dope it, you just shift the pin protection to the lower half of the gap. So the picture is the soft hole just form a small hole from it in the lower half of the gap. So you get a small hole. Carry this is equal to x instead of 1 plus x. So this is so simple. Uh, of course, the modern state is different from a banding state. The mountain set that there must be a third bed. So this bed that I will call it this spinner bed. So that low energy will have a spin sufficient. So the spin performs unique or at a fairment. That's independent of the charge cut. Yeah, so this is my serial spaghetti, right? I'm uh, sorry. Yeah. Maybe not yet quick. But earlier you say uh you know this are uh, really your uh, interacting system. Yes. That's one thing. And also you may not have a free from your own fan theory description. And also you said the mean field doesn't work. Yes. So why do you provide a fan theory? Yeah, so this is a difficulty, actually. I mean, so I have this picture first, but uh, so this picture is not very difficult. I believe I'm not the first one to propose this. But uh, when we ask, why don't we you know, have a theory 30 years ago? So the difficulty is exactly what we are asking. So we actually don't have a good language to Describe this. So you have the picture, you have the understanding, but you don't have the language. So the entire paper I wrote is to propose a language which can capture these three bands. This it turned out to be quite not true. Because more things that is not that easy. Yeah, so the yeah, the difficulty, so why why can't we implement this similar idea? The difficulty is we don't have an actual good description of how upper hover band and lower hover band. So we say it's a band, but it's really not a band. This is just the intuition, it's not correct. Yeah, so they, they, they are some existing theories. So the first one, you, you can try to use the speed test way of being built. Then you can get a band used. But as I said, it's a wrong theory. So let's just ignore it. Uh, there is a more sophisticated theory. So this theory should be correct. Uh, it's called the slave boson theory. It's a quite popular theory. Actually, if you look at the literature, you will find this is a dominated theory. So what is the philosophy of this theory? So the philosophy is that in the most instead, you have a spin charge separation. And in this slow boson, you will implement the spin charge separation by hat. You will recognize this state to be B dang F. You will count B as a whole, you carry the charge on your spin. F and the spin you carry the spin on your charge. The spin charge are really separated. So in this theory, you can describe the spin band, the spinner band very easily. That's basically F. But actually, it's very hard to describe the charge excitation. This, this two upper half of band and lower half of band. The reason is, you know, this is the upper half of band and lower half of band are formed by electron. And in the slave boson theory, the electron is a bound state of the elementary particles. This means that if you want to describe these two bands, you need to use the bound state as like an exact of these two. So that, this is the only field that it's quite complicated. So people of course tried to use the boson theory for Cooper. So at the very temporary it actually works well. So it can give you a good description of the D wave supernet. And if you want to go above TC, you find that the theory is very hard to capture the same element. So somehow I think we need a new framework. But we cannot use the naive nuclear theory. We need to use some exotic theory, but we shouldn't use this one. I mean, another one. That's the motivation of our work. 
another naive question. Yeah. Does it matter which kind of a gauge force, like gauge, gauge field, bound the particles? Uh, that's a higher order question. Yeah, sure. Do you need to choose later? Once you have a partner oh, theory, sorry. you will automatically know the case. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so, so the my motivation I needed to find a new, new kind of picture of more instead, which is different from slave both. So this is some of my intuition. So I noticed uh, there are three equivalent description of more instead. So you can see in more instead, the number of electrons is one. If I want to say it, the number of holes is one. But there is actually a third one, which is equivalent, which is that the number of electrons is equal to the number of holes. So then you cannot just add one electron. So in this picture, it means the charge is frozen because the electron is trapped by a hole. So that I can have the following picture. So I just introduce, I imagine there is a whole object on site that's created by F1. So then I want to implement this third condition. I just add an extra bound term. So this means the electron is bounded to the hole. And because of this, you will get a gap. It is formed by C and F1. So F1, I will interpret it as a hole. So this, I can use this is as the upper carbon band and the lower carbon band. Of course, I also need a spinner, as I said. So I just introduce another kind of Fermi, which I call F2. This is the spinner. So in total, I will have this three bands. And as I, as I said, I can describe so gap maybe with this. So the important thing is the citation of more that are carried by three permits, one is the electron. And we also need the, the other two copies, F1 and F2. And now it's not clear what these two permits are. But I have the intuition that F1 should be viewed as a whole object, F2 should be viewed as speed. But how can we get it? That's the question. So of course we can try to get it from slave boson theory. So in the slave <coughs> boson theory, the speed of map data is obvious. It's just that this the F of the slave boson. Excuse me. But you you already next previous slide you also write the phi. Oh phi is the all the parameter. Phi is that you also choose that would be a mean field description for the condensate for the Yeah, function. yeah, yeah. So the phi is basically proportional to the mod gap. Okay. It's proportional to the charge gap. But does they also assume a mean field description again? It is a mean field of particles. Mean field of uh, Mean field in terms of particles. Hot on. So it does not break anything. It does not need to break anything. It's different from long term mean field theory. Sure. You know, when you do long term mean field theory, it's written for electrons. So it must break something. So this kind of theory is, you know, we don't want to use electrons. We use some particles. And then we run down mean field theory for particles. And then this way, you can describe a very good object. So what, are, what, are, what quantum number does spike uh, uh, have? Uh, I'll explain quantum? it later. That's quite complicated how there is a gauge field involved. But first, uh, we need to understand what F1 means. Yes, so I'm trying to understand how we get F1 and F2. So I think F2 is just the spinner in the slave boson field. And what, what is F1? So basically, C and F1 should be identified as electron. So I believe C and F1 are bound states in the slam bones as far as exactly. So this means in, in the slam bones theory, there are two types of bound states. But it's not clear why we have two types of bound states. And we don't understand the internal structure of these two bound states within the slam bones theory. So again, yeah, I think the slam bones theory is not very useful. We need to use bound state. I don't know how to run down a theory for bound state. That's the problem. So, okay, I need a different theory. Yeah, so how, how do I get some intuition? So, I want to get some intuition from the quantum system. So, why? So, as I said, I wanted to interpret F1 as a whole operator. So, then this term means the electron is bounded with some kind of hole, some kind of correlation hole. And we know in quantum quantum Hall, some similar physics actually happens. So in quantum Hall system, there is a very 
Hoffman theory is called the Hoffman Fermi theory. It means, uh, in this theory, it means the electron is also bounded to some kind of uh, harmonic flow. They form a uh, bound state, and this bound state moves. So it seems there is something common. So I just asked myself whether I can get some intuition from the quantum form system. So in quantum form system, how do we introduce the correlation hole? So the most popular approach is to do flux attachment. Now this is because in quantum form system, this correlation hole has another property. So as a whole, first, it has a negative charge. And it also has a neutral statistics. Is the electron, it's a vortex. So you can use, so the, the, it has two properties. You can use the one of them to introduce the, introduce the hole. And in this popular flux attachment approach, you use the flat planet, the vortex, you use the very base to introduce it. However, in cooperator, I believe the conventional hole may not have this very base, this neutral statistics. So I cannot use this theory. So I don't think this kind of theory can be generalized to other systems. Excuse me. Yeah. Just make sure. So when you write this, uh, the the term in the Hamiltonian as interaction, right? So C is double. C is that C is electron. Yeah. Or which is double it in SU two is a fundamental in SU two, and F is also fundamental in SU two. Uh, can I explain this later? Because now I think the F one is not clear. Oh, just want to what's quantum. Yeah, I'll explain, of course. So the following now there's another approach to introduce quantum Fermi in quantum form system. This is called the Pascal Dan Rizzi approach. Um, this approach is not well known, so I guess only a few people in the world actually know it. So fortunately, I, I belong to this approach. <laughs> so yeah, so they are trying to understand the quantum Fermi leap that the boson from new equal to one. And they wanted to describe it in a completely in the low cell of the depth. So you cannot do it in with class of attachment. So they must develop a new theory. So what is their theory? Uh, let me just give you the basic idea. Uh, I don't have time to give them. So the idea is so you have a physical boson. The feeling is what? Uh, they have the correct intuition that we need some hope and we bound this B and this hole. So they have the intuition. So the question is, how do you introduce this hole? So their idea is very simple. I need this hole, I just introduce it by height. So they just introduce some Fermi F. This Fermi F has the opposite charge of B, so it's a hole. And the feeling is also one. And now you have a question, because now you introduce F, the Fermi space is large. That's a different problem. You don't want to study a different problem. So you must constrain your Fermi space back. So what are they going to do? They are going to say, so first I introduce this Fermi F, but finally I will constrain this Fermi F, this auxiliary Fermi F, to form a trivial state. So the trivial state is just an integer quantum constant. So that's a thin one, just from an integer quantum constant. And then you have this enlarged trivial space will come back to the classical theory. So this is what they are going to do. So I will not go through the details. So the important thing is, so with B and F, they can have some Fermi operator. And with this Fermi operator, they can form a Fermi surface. And they can run down a wave function in form of B and F. So this wave function has two different types of coordinates. One is Z, one is W. So Z is the coordinate of B, that's the physical coordinate. And you also have W. W is the coordinate of this auxiliary Fermi <coughs> But now you need to project this F to form a trivial state, to form the interquantum host. Yeah. So why do you call it trivial? I mean, it's not as topologically mean yeah, as... Yeah, yeah, that, that's true. But, uh, but sorry, with the boundary, at the boundary you would have... There's all yeah, the so there is some, some subject here with this, but okay. let's ignore it, because this is not a problem. Yeah, okay. So that. you're interested in bulk excitation, say, yeah. and then it's trivial. Is that the point of view? Doesn't matter for my purpose. So. Okay. Yeah, so the idea is you just uh, do the projection, just uh, calculate the overlap with the interquantum cost. You integrate this W, then you get a physical state. The final wave function is just interquantum cost. So it's a physical wave function. So the fundamentally, the integration of W or the trace of F in this case can be done analytically. 
I mean, now you get a wave function. And you found that this wave function is exactly equal to the HLR wave function. It's a mass test. And we know HLR wave function is actually a good description of compound, compound behavior. Then this means that you know, this kind of approach to the oxygen reform actually gives a, a good description of compound behavior. So here, yeah, we, when you say HLR wave function, uh, HR wave function projected to the low slot level. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't want to go too deep. Uh, I just want to introduce this new kind of structure. We don't care about the compound in this talk. So the original HLR, is that meant to be for helium fraction one half? Oh, you can do it on, on one of those. Uh, as a different question, I'm happy to discuss it. Yeah, so, so the lesson I learned is that uh, we can have a new type of part series. So in this part theory, we just add some auxiliary fermions. It's like the acidic qubits. And now we can constrain the acidic qubits to form a trivial product, trivial state. So that we can recover the physical ground, physical hyperspace. So this is kind of a new part theory. And I want to use this, apply this new part theory to prove and other problems. So this new theory is useful because now I have this picture. Uh, I need, a, from this picture, I need the F1 left. I don't know how to introduce it. But now in this new theory, it's very easy to introduce. I just to say, there are F1 left. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, I need to constrain it to form a trivial state. But in this case, F1 and F2, I will constrain them to form a all sides single at each side. So Ruba asked a question. So for compound, I have to enter compound in order to product. So there is actually some subject for the previous theory. But on this one, there is no such sub. This is really a trivial product state. That's completely true. So this is my theory. So basically, I enlarge the hyper space by introducing F1 and F2. So that I can have a Fermi infinite theory in terms of C, F1 and F2. From infinite theory, you can run down the selected determinant. Say F1 and F2. If it were depending on infinite assets, I will introduce the assets later. But then you project, you know, you just project to this constraint. Basically, you just calculate the overlap in this constraint. You will trace the F1 and F2 part. Then you just get a, a wave function which lives in the physical hyperspace. And so the hope is that with this kind of theory, we can understand so the gap. So of course, you know, this, so now we have uh, model wave functions. So one approach is we just use it as a variation of assets. We try to minimize the parameters numeric and calculate the property. And we also want to have some intuitive understanding or analytic understanding. <coughs> so how do we analytically understand it? So, we, so the so just as the conventional part of theory for spin geek, uh, we don't really need to do the projection numerically. So actually, the, this kind of projection or constraint is equivalent to some gauge constraint. So you can do it numerically, but there is an alternate native approach is that we introduce gauge constraint. And we can analyze the property of the place by gauge theory, which we are familiar with. So this is the one I'm going to do later. So we wanted to understand the constraint of this uh, of this trivial product state. So I think it's equivalent to the following three constraints. So first, the density of F1 is 1. Second, the density of F2 is 1. So we have 1 F1 and 1 F2 at each side. This is the first constraint. Then you need to add the third one. The third one is saying F1 and F2 form a spin singlet. Basically, you say the spin operator is equal to zero. I think this is a constraint. And then you can understand the gauge structure. So F1, the density of F1 equal to 1. That's a U1 constraint. This one is another U1 for F2. So we have a 2 U1 constraint. And this one is basically a SU2 constraint. <coughs> So it means because you form a spin cyclic, it means you can repeat the spin freely. Uh, yeah. Why 
is the last constraint to be zero? Why not just a constant? It form a singlet. Now we want them to form this trivial product. This is the same. Uh, so this means the spin index carried by F is actually not a physical spin index. And it's really rotating. So this kind of skin rotation for F is actually a base, which is the S into X. So the, there seems to be a max constraint at the last the equation. Sorry? There, there seems to be two, two constraints. So summing over a what uh, I mean the total speed constraints. S one plus S two equal. It's three constraints for the vector. Uh -huh. The vector is three. I mean yeah, here is a vector. I mean S X equal to there, S Y equal to there, S Z equal to there. That's it. I just want to say that this is a spin sequence. So total spin of, uh, of the two Yeah, the total spin of this two formula. Physically, what would happen if you had a triplet the condition here instead? I mean, that's not my constraint. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I mean, that, that's a state outside of the physical Hilbert space. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so, so naively, you will find a three gauge field you want, you want, and uh, as you to find it, turn out uh, you know, the real gauge structure is even larger because of something which we are very familiar with. The reason is because you know you have one electron by f1. So this means that it's basically a spin. So you have one electron. You can also say you have one hole. So basically you can you know, rotate the electron to a hole. So this is something we are very familiar with. So basically it means that this u1 is usually united to the SU2. This u1 from f2 you also need to be united to the SU2. Uh, but this is not important. So in this talk I'm very restricted. That's the u1 cross u1 cross s2. I mean, if you want to extend the series s2 to s2, so here you apply all the constraints. There's no degree of freedom left. Yeah, that's true. It's everything is in the C. All yeah, the yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah, but somehow this helps you. It, it's yeah, somehow this helps. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm very obsessed to this type of structure. Just make sure. So. The, the U1 is in the, the U1 is embedded into the SU2 along the, say, the, one of the generator of SU2, like Z. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's totally. Okay. And the, 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 what's the Z2 U model? It's a diagonal of a 1 and 2 is identified with the S. Yeah, yeah, so let me last time. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Two, but it also belongs to the U1 class. Remind me again, what, what do you need SU2? What's true with SU2? Oh, this one. Right. But I want oh. them to form a single. But, but I said uh, the, the one and two. Oh, yeah, this. What? This is something you can find in Chabot's textbook. Uh, it's not important for this talk. Maybe I'll tell you. So it turns out uh, you can do this kind of thing. Okay. Yeah, basically, you can rotate the electron to hold. This does not change the state. So physically, it means you know you have one electron per second. You can also say you have one hold per second. So there's another approach to introduce this theory. So, so now in this previous theory, you know, we, when we impose this constraint, actually F1 and F2 are completely dead. But then somehow we wanted to solve this constraint. So we don't want them to be dead. We want to have a theory from C and F1 and F2. So we found a different approach. So in this approach, I will not say F1 and F2 are oxidative property. I will say they are rare. They are true physical degree of freedom. Uh, so let's consider the following hypothesis. So imagine we have 
the system has three layers. So the first layer is the physics layer. That's the hardware model for concrete. But we introduce another two layers. We will call it the hidden layer. So these two layers basically have a spin one half per subject. One is called S1, the other one is called S2. Then you can run down some kind of time continuum which covers these three layers. Uh, so one important thing is, you know, previ previously I have a constraint, but here I will not make this constraint as a hard constraint. Instead, I will make it as an energetic constraint. So I will introduce a spin coupling, J2, between these two spins. And when J2 is going to really infinite, you know, S1 and S2 will be dead. You will just form a two But we, we, we don't need to make them really thick. We can just focus on the dark J2 limit. So now we can describe some state using the both say S1 and S2. And finally, we can take the J2 to infinite limit. So in this Hamiltonian, you can also introduce some part which can recover the gauge theory I just described. Sorry, is that what's the dimension of this model? Every layer is a 2D square lattice. Yeah, so just to uh, be confused on the constraint, can you not have a bound state of F1 and F2? Yeah, I'll try a little bound. Because it's just obviously charged. I mean, you take the J2 to infinity, uh, you know, they just form a signet. They were just a date. Of course, when J2 is not an infinite, it's large, but not infinite, you can have some subdivision. I mean, my point is, you know, we, we can go to the J2 very large limit. Now we can, you know, S1 and S2 are, are, are gapped. You can integrate them out. You then get a Hamiltonian which is only in the physical server space. So I introduced this layer that just for technical reasons to help us. Yeah. So the auxiliary, auxiliary layers here are the spins? So oh, yeah, yeah, that's half. Hmm? That's spin one half. Okay, but they're purely spin, they don't have charge degrees of freedom. Right? Yeah, yeah, they're purely spin. So then how do I relate it to the Fs? So the C here is the that's same That's the speed. next slide. Ah, okay. <laughs> I mean, there is a very basic construction around that spin operator in the program. So S1 hour, use F1. S2 hour, use F2. And in this, you know, it's SU2. If you are familiar with spin, spin liquid, you know, there must be a SU2 structure. But these two constraints are not enough. Because with this two constraints, you can have some gap is spin liquid from F1 and F2. But this is not correct. Because in, we want to go to the large K2 limit. We really want to gap out S1 and S2. We don't want them to be gapless. And uh, if we go to the large K2 limit, S1 and S2 are gapped. So this is actually like a multi state in the spin channel. And how do we understand the, this kind of spin mode gap? We can get some intuition from the multi instead of the charge gap. You know, how do we understand multi instead of charge gap? We basically introduce a slave boson. We say the slave boson will carry the U1 charge rotation. And then we gap out this slave boson. We only have a spin degree. Really to you okay, I want to do similar things because I want to go to large J2 limit. So I know S1 and S2 are will be gapped. So <coughs> now I introduce some slave, in this case, a slave spin. And I let this slave spin carry the physical SU2. And when this slave spin is gapped in the large J2 limit, I will have this F. And this F will not carry screen anymore. It covers to a SU2 gauge. I mean, this is basically another way to just derive the gauge theory I introduced here. I mean, it's quite equivalent. So, anyway, finally, we should have a theory in terms of C, F1, and F2. And there are three gauge fields. So, this three SU2 gauge fields. And the, the last SU2 gauge field is basically just a spin rotation for F. The first two are the familiar one in the spin language, spin nuclear language. Yeah, so is 
Rita, any question? I'll go through the specific answers. And maybe let me emphasize that this F1 and F2, they do not carry any speed on the charge. So they don't have any physical number. So, sorry, can, can you explain what's the third SU2 you have? The third, third SU2 gauge. Oh, this one? Yeah. Oh, because you want them to be gapped. There are two ways. So the first way, you make it a hard constraint, you want them to form a spin signal. Uh -huh. Now you know, for spin signal, you just rotate the spin. You rotate the spin, you make an SU2 gauge transformation for a signal. So that SU2 only comes when you take the large J2 Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we should take the large J2. Only in this limit, we can recover the physics. Otherwise, we are describing a different problem. Yeah, so now we know the part and we know the gate structure, so that we can open up new gate structure. So first, in this language, how do you understand the thermal leak? It's actually very simple. You want the thermal leak to be a confined phase. But you want F1 to form all some signal and the strong as you to get the flat tension. Then they will just disappear. You want to have C from a large facilities. First clear at the air from leak is a confinement. And uh, of course, the one important goal for us is to understand the subgap mate. So I'll, I'll already give you a picture of this subgap mate. It's here. So our goal is just to run down answers which capture the, this picture. So, so first, we want to see an F1 to hybridize together and uh, get a gap. So this is easy. You know, you run a uh, tight bonding model for C, and you run a uh, tight bonding model for F. And the important thing is you need to add this term. So this term is like the x bonding term. It binds electron C to hold uh, F. So this one will have the row of induce the mod gap. So, of course, now we want to understand, you know, what, what is the gauge field after this term? So it turns out this term is actually a Higgs term. So after this term, so SU21 and SU2S will be completely fixed. Uh, it's actually very easy to understand it uh, intuitively. Because here, you hybridize C and F. And you know, you, you can basically identify F forms sigma and C sigma. You know, after this hybridization, you know, F will really lack an electron. So then the spin index carried by F will become physics index. In another language, the SU2 gauge field, the internal SU2 gauge field will be locked to the physics gauge SU2. And also the F will also carry the charge, physics charge. So in another word, so the U1 part of this SU2 one will be locked to the physical electrical magnitude. Is there any question? I mean, this is a fixed term first. You now two, two of these as you are gone. You can ignore the truth. So now you only have this uh, third. Oh, this is wrong. So this should be as you do two, not as you do S. So because now, because of, we fix these two, especially we fix as you two S, so then the spin index carried by F1 and F2 is now physical spin index. This is not, so now we can use F2 as a spin. That's still neutral because it does not come to the PDP1. So now it's spin, it carries spin. So before this term, F1 and F2 are really ghost. They don't carry spin and they don't carry charge. After this term, you will make F1 as the electron. You will make the F2 as the spin. And in the same time, you will induce a gap. This, this is. As, as like the Higgs mechanism in the high energy physics, after the Higgs transition, you will make the gauge field massive. Meanwhile, you will give a mass to it. Like oh, sorry, I was I having an early question about the phi's quantum number. Oh, yeah, here. Yeah. So it carries both the. It's more complicated than. Uh, if you want to be precise, you should run. Down and the matrix, two by two matrix, 
and it uh, couples to both the uh, SU2. Right? It couples two U to get rid. One is the internal U to get rid. Like this one, this guy. Then you first couple to U, internal get rid like this. But the back also couples to the physical U to get rid. The physical U1 and the physical U2. And as a result, when you condense back, you will not get rid. Not Another thing is that why why if I cannot carry you are doing the summation first and then have a phi as an overall factor, but why not phi can be spatial dependence? Spatial dependence. Space sp space dependence. So that I mean, you, 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 you can do that. You can do that. It's higher 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 order. Yeah, yeah, you can do that, but uh, I mean, I, I, I want to have a very very simple answer. Uh, and uh, maybe you cannot do that. The reason is, you know, I mean, you are allowed to do this, uh, to do it, but I uh, think it's not consistent with the physical intuition. So we have a physical intuition that this phi is actually a mod gap. Uh, don't think mod gap can have a spatial dependence. Mod gap. Mod gap does not really translate. But if you have a spatial index, can you do something like CW? Yeah, you can do it. Actually, I think uh, if you wanted to describe some kind of weakness crest, maybe you can. But for the more things that we are interested in, I don't think there is a translation. Yeah, you, you can generalize the theory. Yeah. So let me just understand this, the phase that you're proposing, uh, independent of these variables, the, the phase that you're proposing for the domain. You mean that's this picture? Yeah, just in terms of universal property, what is the, it's an FL star phase you're proposing? Uh, so you, you do, uh, let's say exactly, I think it's actually general, general, more general than at first start. So, so yeah. So uh, first, I, I want to say the third gap is not gap. That's inferior from not gap. Uh -huh. This is this left part. But that's from this left part. You will have a small frame surface. Now you need to understand what is the, how you will satisfy the Latino constraint. So then you need to have the spin part, the spin part. So the spinner part is covered from the charge part. And uh, if this spinner does form a spin you know that this is called FL star. But in this language, the spinner can also form some kind of magnet, an anti magnet, or even fair magnet. In this case, it's like a simple primitive mate that's beyond the mean physics. Yeah, basically, I want to say, you know, in the body insulator, the Spin order actually does not matter for the charge gap. So I wanted to say this third gap is inherited from the mod gap. Then the spin order also does not matter. So I wanted to say the third gap is at a high energy scale. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know your, your spin group freedom can have freedom to do something else independently. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can add more remarks. So you just and I felt start away from and, and What's new is that there are many previous wave functions for doped antiferro magnets, but they're all wave functions for uh, charge ons, basically, or, or right. they're, they're, you always get wave functions for fractionalized particles, from your pockets of fractionalized particles. Right. Uh, it's hard to write down a full star. Yeah, there's nothing for the full star. You always say, oh, you got spin ons and whole ons, and they're going to bind. And then you just wave your hands. Mm -hmm. That's typically what's done. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so in the slow boson theory, you, you just say you know you do the whole you know this boson and uh, from it does form a bound state. It's bound bound state form a small mm -hmm. it. and uh, then you know the remaining electron they just contribute the spin like the moment. You know, charge spin separates. Uh, yeah, but in that theory, you know first you it's hard to run down if it's theory. Bound state is involved, yeah. and also you don't understand the fermion arc. It's hard for me to understand the Fermiak in that picture. Hmm. Oh, why you have a Fermiak hmm. instead of frame surface? So you show a full point where the Fermiak comes with the gap? Uh, yeah, 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 but uh, that's uh, I mean, it's easy to understand because this pocket uh, is formed by CNF1. And uh, in experiment, you can only see C. Not that one. Yeah, maybe I will show you this. I mean, there are these timer model wave functions, but they are again also very complicated. Lots of constraints and so on. You can write on various timer models, things like that. But, okay. Yeah, I think this is the simplest picture. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, if FR star is really the pseudo gap, I mean, 
No, I'm, I'm, just, the best I'm just trying to explain why this idea is of yours is really new and interesting. That's all. <laughs> but do you have a wave function, a projected wave function? Can you write it? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. It's just this camera. You have a mean phase theory can run that state that you but you need to import this constraint. Yeah, but can you do the projection? Uh, uh, you cannot do it efficiently with dimensional model. Uh -huh. But there may be other numerical. Uh -huh. That's a future project that wants to do. <laughs> yes, as I said, so, so this is the mean field action from CNF1. So we will realize the first part. Uh, we needed to have the F2 as a spinner. So we can run down many different essence for a spinner. And in all the answers, maybe I sign them But for square lattice, I think there is a very natural answer based on previous studies. That's that's the U1 transfer. If you want, you can make a this one. Choose your favorite for having six dimensions. In this framework, you are allowed to change the answers for speed, which does not change the chart. So this is my theory of also the gap made in Yeah, I'll show you some prompt. Also from this picture, you can easily understand that there is a small pocket. But as I said in the beginning, in our past, you see an arc. And if you see an arc, that's one difficulty. I will explain it later. So first, this gap is induced by this gap. So we need to yeah, that's around that some answers for back on you know, illustration purpose. And in reality, we should determine by uh, either numerics or physics in the experiments. If you are just want to give you some intuition, so this not, may not be the correct method. So anyway, I introduced these answers. I also introduced some answers by for the Hawking answers. I just showed by hand, it may not be the precise one. But I think the physics is quite general. Introduce the physics. So the important thing is that you know, you look at these answers. So that's the one where we hover that to extract something like this. So especially you expect some small pockets like this. Yeah, it's very easy to get a small pocket. And the firm surface area is equal to x, equal to the dot. Uh, but the problem is that you know, in RPS, you cannot detect the F1. You only detect the C. So if you look at the, this small pocket, uh, so here I have two colors. So the, the red line is actually dominated by C1, C, Philip there. And the blue line is dominated by F1. But then if you do RPS, you will only see the R. Yeah. So this is the RPS only for C degree C. Yeah, of course, the back side will have some small spectral weight, which is not in zero, but uh, you know, even in numerics, you cannot see it. In experiments, I uh, don't believe you can see it. Uh, in the end of the arc, you may see something. Why is it hard to see the other one? Hmm? Why is it hard to see the other one? Oh, because side? in the experiments, the R-pass, you cover to see, you only cover to see. So what the R-pass mirrored is with this trunk. So I pass it measure this color. Can you measure F at all? Uh, F, you know, in my F is a non-local object. It's a non-local color in the The overlap with the actual is zero. But I guess you have condensed C dagger F. Right. So, yeah. when you done that, uh, you have mixed hybridized C dagger and F. Yeah, I'll condense the dagger. So, in principle, F1 is also like an electron, uh, but yes, yes, numerically yes. it may be smaller. The, the matrix elements are smaller. Yeah, so strictly speaking, you should see some small right. paper here. I mean, just this is small, you don't see it. Yeah. I think that's the aspect of the color scale. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, Maybe I can show the different colors here, you can see it. No, but I think his question is, you know, why is, the, why is there a contrast, right? Maybe if the bed of the condensate is really small. That, yeah, exactly. Yeah. If the condensate is very large, you'll see the whole thing. Principally, you have the whole thing. 
it's not a Fermi arc. But it, in an experiment, it may look like a Fermi arc. Uh, yeah, yeah, so obviously, it's very different. Right? So it is a small Fermi surface. It is a Fermi surface. Just that the backside is very hard. This is some face diagram uh, just drawn. Uh, yeah, so this blue line is the uh, SF from five, so I just choose one atlas. And then this red line is the atom of the gap. Uh, I calculated the atom of the gap with the new BC. Uh, so there, there is one thing I want to emphasize that uh, you know, the onset of the atom of the gap may not uh, coincide with the onset, onset of the buff. Uh, the reason is the simple. It depends. Now, whether you can gap up them will depend on the free surface shape. Well, for some assets, like the anti-dark truth, you know, at the large dot, you find these two free surfaces, uh, you know, they don't connect with each other. Basically, you know, even you add a five, you don't gap up them. That they form a annular free surface. And in this case, you, if you do a test, you will only see the dark free surface. But actually, it is the solid gap. Okay? If you mirror the hot number, I think hot number is small. Mm. It doesn't cannot detect it in the hot pass. So this means, uh, now this is a true trigger point for the gap, maybe. But then at the lower dosing, there may be a weak phase transition, which opens the end of the gap. But of course, this is specific to my assets, which I just put that high. So in reality, I don't know. There should be more careful around this critical range. Okay. So in this slide, I want to discuss so the critical point. So how that so, so we, we now have a theory of possible gap meter. So we wanted to you know, understand how we evolve the solid gap meter to the Fermi degree. So the in the solid gap meter. Now, our new feed assets will take basically this five days. Then there, there should be a critical point. So the critical point is tuned by the mass of that. So it's a condensation transition from Higgs transition. But there is one important question is, you know, once you go beyond this critical point, whether you recover the thermodynamics immediately or not, it's not clear. Because if you follow just the mean field theory, when you go Go beyond this critical point. So phi is uh, zero, does not condense. You have a deep phi gate field. But F1 actually form a firm surface. So it means in this region, F1 form a ghost firm surface. I call it a ghost, but it does not carry either the charge or the speed. So you can only detect it in thermal. Of course, this ghost firm surface will cover to U1 cross SU2 gate field. So one important question is now whether this ghost from surface can be stable or not. Uh, I don't have a good answer now because I think uh, this is not a universal question. So the reason is you know the SU2 gate field can actually induce attractive interaction in the single channel, so it can induce pressure. But this U1 gate field actually suppresses pressure. So there is a competition. Whether this ghost from surface is stable or depend on which coupling is larger. Now, these two coupling are, can in principle be independent. I think the answer depends on some initial conditions, some UV physics. I mean, in some cases, we may have an intermediate phase with the Fermi liquid coexist with the ghost second. But in some other case, this ghost second. So when the SU2 gate coupling is larger, this ghost from surface is not uh, stable or be paired, then SU2 gate field can just combine. And then in that case, you know, we, we know this phase cannot be stable, but then the question is whether the critical point can be stable. I mean that one possibility is in critical point, you know, SU2 gate application is suppressed by the Higgs boson. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can have a direct transition between so the gap and from the But this is need some balance. I'm not sure whether it can be 
realize or not, so we need some careful analysis. Uh, there is a more generic uh, case, I think, uh, which is the following itself, uh, which is that uh, even the critical point cannot be stable. So in this case, you cannot have a continuous strategy. You may have a, so the critical point will have some instability. For example, it will become an ordered place, like a soup plant. Then you will have maybe a soup plant that will cover this critical point. I mean, anyway, I think uh, these are just the conjectures. I think the bench of pretty rigid is not clear at all. So we need to study this. No, we have an action, of course, but we need to study the RD flow of the action very carefully. This is a very, very hard problem. You probably will spend a lot of time on it. So, so what is the superconductor in this language? Let's say you're on the pseudo gap site, right? Um, yeah, so I think we need another option. So here you have a bind on the parameter. So C and F1, they cover together. And F2, they form a super. Then you can add a, a third order parameter, another order parameter, which covers the F1 and F2. Mm -hmm. You can imagine there is a SU2 variation. You can induce some coupling in F1 and F2. If you cover them together, you will get the super. So you, you need like a Z2. It's been like good in the F1 and the F2. I mean, F2 is already a kind of It's already there. Uh -huh. But actually, I think this is an open question. So how, how do you connect the sort of gap connector to the sort of gap? Yeah, that's not clear, actually. I think you, you, you can have a transition, direct transition from this FR star to sort of gap. But I think the problem is uh, you know, close to this direct transition zone, this uh, additional order parameter is too small. This means uh, close to this critical transition, you may have a lot of nodes. But F1 and F2 can also be nodes. I'm not sure whether this is consistent with the experiments or not. Mm -hmm. I see. So if you have a D wave superconductor, it will intersect that pocket twice. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So of course, in our path, you only see one, so it's consistent with sure. our path, but yeah, I'm not sure whether it's, well. it's consistent with some connectivity. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, anyway, I think the connection to super connector is not very good. We need a few more studies. Um, 20 minutes. Okay. Yeah, so, Whatever. yeah, so one. So when we have a theory, we want to have some prediction which can be used to disprove this theory. So I will offer a prediction. So this theory can be disproved. It's not a, some other type of theory which can never be. I have two other questions. questions. Yeah. Uh, one is that, uh, is there something special for the superconductivity for D-Wave in, in your model? Uh, it's, probably, it's probably related to the answer about spin. That's not actually have. Uh, this is from previous studies. In the group rate, in square analysis, uh, found that uh, if you have a spin, the most uh, possible state is this. This has some new Another question is I think uh, maybe I'm just not uh, I think Shubir has a previous work with Alex Thompson on Hubble model with three bands. The, that was just conventional. That paper with Alex was all Landau phase transitions. Okay. There was nothing in the context of the So this theory has a uh, interesting results. Uh, actually, quite a scanty prediction. So from the encrypted doping, it were predicted that it won't have a ghost from service. Now you can detect this goes from some similar to mean the same states should be inert by several times, at least twice. So if you look at some data of the server T, which we have recently, actually found that the critical region, you know, the decibel states is indeed caused by several times. Uh, however, you know, this does not prove any significant problem. We need to subtract the contribution from the from liquid part. And to do this, we need the information of the effect mass from quantum oscillation. I don't think there is now. So hopefully people will give this information 
I don't test whether there is a ghost. So this is a summary of the Any questions? So, 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 so the naive band structure, where is the one of singularities? Oh, it's quite large. It's, it's in the overdose region. Nothing really interesting is related to that house. So there are many papers on that house in the 90s. Now, if you do the paper, that is irrelevant. OK, so maybe let me discuss some other application of this theory. Yeah, so first, you know, so, so in previous guides, discuss the transition shown by Doshi, but you can also have a transition to the bacterial. So this is some space diagram I uh, imagined based on my theory. Basically, I've drawn some red lines. So the red line is the onset of fire. So inside of this red line, we should have some solid gap matter. Uh, so in my picture, the solid gap matter is inherited from molten state. In some sense, molten state is a special solid gap. It means molten state can also be understood just use this alternative. But then you can ask the following question. So let me fix my dope to there and choose the bandwidth. So how do we understand the hot the transition in this way? Uh, so in this theory, actually, it seems the draw the Fermi liquid will first go into a sort of gap meter first before you enter the molecules. So after this transition, you will lose most of your Fermi surface, but then you cannot. Uh, Gap out all of the chromosomes completely. So what's the reason? So the reason is, you know, if you want to gap out them completely, you need a cell that form to have exactly the same chromosome. Of course, their density is the same. Unless you have a like a continuous rotation signature. <coughs> their chromosomes do not need to contact. You enter a small, you enter a region with a small part of the before you go to the chromosome. So this signal transition is just a leap history. But we believe, like in track the 90s, you know, we have almost a rotation continuous region. Continuous rotation symmetry. Uh, we believe this region may be very, very, very narrow. Which means if you go to finite temperature, you may only see one point. Let me escape this slide. Uh, and the signal one, I'll comment on the condo breaking down transition. So in the heavy burning system, sometimes people also see a, 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 an interesting transition. So they tune the magnetic field of pressure. They find a transition between a larger firm surface as the firm leak and a transition with the small firm surface. But this time it had the atom frame magnet as not as their stuff. So naively, because this small firm surface has the symmetry break, you may think this transition as the ordinary transition. And in the experiment, we found the whole number actually drops across this transition. And meanwhile, there is a spirit matter close to this critical point. So you cannot describe this to, you know, with the not the other transition. So here, I mean, I, I, we basically can try to apply our framework to this problem. So the important intuition is that, you know, this small firm surface of state may not be described by Actually, people have proposed that this before, you know, we should understand it as some kind of break it up on some more trade. Basically, you know, some part of firm surface just get more localized. Um, but in previous series, you know, there is a challenge for the uh, experiments. Two things are happening together. The one is the chart gap, the other one is this order. It's very hard to make them happen together. And in the theory we use, we can actually make them happen. Uh, another one is uh, this theory can be easily generalized as you can And that's kind of true of some escape. Uh, the third one is I'm thinking maybe we should uh, use this idea to do some numerics. So in the numerics, so, so in, the, in the previous, I uh, talked about the theoretical. You know, theoretically, as you to do some less, I see the qubits. But maybe it's also good for numerical. You, know, you, you introduce some asymmetric qubits in the larger thermal space, and you describe a, you some test network on matrix product state. For example, 
you control, you trace out this asymmetric space. You get the lens as with the, within that's the physical hyper space. So why is this useful? Particularly in fusion event, if you just, uh, if your target is uh, a state which has a lot of entanglement within just this physical plane, it's very hard to capture it. But if you use some asymmetric cubics, you can distribute the entanglement here. This may be used. But this is just some vague idea. I'm not sure whether it can work in practice. Maybe worse exploring. That's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Yao Hui, for the very nice talk. Any questions? Comments? Can you replay the MVP? Can you see more of the condo breakdown? How is that possible to have this? Oh, you can. Like the F1 and F2 carry the neon and the So before the onset of time, they are closed in the same as the other. After the S. So you have condo ladders coupled to F1 and F2? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And what you need? Yeah, confinement to happen at the same time as the event. So confinement drives you to magnetic order. You're assuming that. There's some strong coupling gauge uh, physics you're using. No, 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 no. That's Higgs. So I let F1 and F2 have the in all the assets. Okay. Across this transition. Now let the back on six. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Project out spin waves and all of that. Yeah, okay. That's because of the gate field. Yeah, because of the gate field. Yeah. And when you offset this back, yeah. now that, then you know this index now becomes field index. And you will see this back on. And that also gives you a gap. So the gap has seen the brick at the same time. Comments or questions? No, let's thanks. Yeah, okay. Thank you.